leaked that bombshell book rocking the White House. Michael Wolff's fire and fury. Inside. More troubling allegations is that the president is mentally unfit for office. They sent a letter to the author demanding he not release this book. Legitimate questions are now being raised about the reliability of the book. It's extraordinary. They pretty much had free reign of this place. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we've been tracking this week. Michael Wolff throws the book at Donald Trump, exposing a dysfunctional White House and a thing or two about the U.S. mainstream news media. Egypt and the talk show hosts on the front lines of the CC government's propaganda efforts, night after night after night. The protests in Iran and the social media battlegrounds that matter there. Plus, oppressors of the press, the worst of the worst. In the age of Twitter and the 24-hour news cycle, a book launch might seem like a story for a slow news day, unless it's Fire and Fury by Michael Wolff, a journalist who divides opinion on his approach to sourcing and to the facts. Having inveigled his way into the Trump White House to tell the inside story of the administration, he describes a president with the barest grasp of his responsibilities, suffering from a gradual loss of his faculties. In short, Wolf goes there, using the D word that mainstream news outlets had shied away from, dementia. While Wolf's publishers stand firm against Donald Trump's lawyers and the threat of litigation, copies of the book are flying off the shelves. The American mainstream news media remain hypnotized by a spectacle they did much to create. Our starting point this week, the White House. The president has said fire and fury was making headlines before the first copy was sold. That bombshell book rocking because the White House. Because this book has come out and everybody's head has exploded. It is a devastating portrait of the Trump family. The excerpts alone fueled two entire news cycles, 48 hours of coverage, peppered with angry tweets coming out of the Oval Office or perhaps the president's bedroom. Winning the presidency qualifies him as not smart but genius. And a very stable genius at that. If the White House actually thought that threatening the publisher with a lawsuit would stop the inevitable, it was wrong. The publication date was moved up. The book is published as of 9 o'clock this morning. The president's lawyer sent a cease and desist letter to which you say? Actually, what I say is, uh, is wait, where do I send the box of chocolates? This particular book is the kind of presidential history that this particular pres president deserves. The calamity of this particular president has generated a kind of journalism which is not predicated on the politics of substance, but on the politics of subterfuge and show. There is nothing in this book that actually addresses the fundamental issues of this presidency, but actually banks on a kind of sensationalism that now is extended into the formation of a book uh, just between two covers. We can't get enough of this. Whether or not every one of those anecdotes can be trusted, you know, we will see. I'm sure that more reporting will continue to play out. But what Wolf has offered is this behind the scenes, fly on the wall, look at a, an administration that people are still trying to figure out just how it functions on a day-to-day -day basis. We've seen a lot of confirmation bias by people who want to believe that Donald Trump is exactly as depicted in the book, and others who are saying, well, frankly, this is really not all that new. We also see some jealousy, perhaps, of Michael Wolff by other journalists who have covered Trump uh, very uh, closely, and then perhaps they're upset that they're not the ones getting all the attention now. The idea that Michael Wolff merely gathered known journalistic tidbits and repackaged them in book form is only partly true. Inevitably, there is some of that. Both the New York Times and the Washington Post have new reports about the mind of Donald Trump. There has been plenty of reporting on President Trump's mental stability, his temperament. However, when it came to the possible signs of dementia, news outlets have treated that with caution. And no one had ever quoted Steve Bannon, Trump's former advisor, describing meetings with Russian contacts as treasonous before. That led to a series of attacks from Trump and Bannon's ouster from Breitbart News, one of the online voices of the American alt-right. Journalists covering the White House either did not find those stories, or if they did, their editors chose not to publish them. Mainstream news outlets like to say they hold power to account, but they also tend to build bridges to power. And burning those bridges can mean losing future access that can come back to burn them. 
Early on, some journalists decided to sacrifice their integrity for access. Wolf kind of had the same idea. He went in there to do access journalism and then realized he would burn his bridges uh, at the end of this by publishing the results. And so I think that if anything, uh, we should be having a broader conversation about what the purpose of access journalism is in a government um, that wants to essentially function as an autocracy, a government that routinely attacks the press and threatens journalists. So we were talking before the break. On the media's reluctance to discuss Donald Trump and the possibility of dementia, here's MSNBC's morning host, Joe Scarborough, regarding a column that he writes for The Washington Post. I've written twice in my column uh, a, a quote about one of people closest to Donald Trump during the campaign saying he's got early stage of dementia. He repeats the same stories over and over again. His father had it. But twice the Washington Post would not let me put that in my column. And until your book came out, this was something we were not allowed to speak about. Like so many in the mainstream media, Joe Scarborough has come a long way on Trump compared to the early days of the election cycle when his program was addicted to the candidate, the ratings he would draw, the revenues he would generate. Scarborough has a lot of blood on his hands because back when it was in Joe Scarborough's self-interest, he gave Donald Trump enormous access to his show. I've been talking about you for a week. With very, very light questioning. Now all of a sudden he wants to say that he has a source saying that Trump has uh, early onset dementia. To me, that would be something that you would need an on the record source for. Michael Wolff admits in his preface that on questions of sourcing and verification, many of the accounts in the book are in conflict with one another, that in some cases they are for the reader to judge, and that he had settled on a version of events I believe to be true. That's not so much of a preface as it is a disclaimer. However, while Wolf has become a lightning rod for those critical of the state and standards of American journalism today, the role of his publisher, Macmillan, has been largely ignored, which is odd, since without the publisher's distribution network, the writer's words would go unread. Macmillan says it had one editor and three fact-checkers working with Wolf. However, some basic errors, including getting names wrong, still made it into print. Michael Wolf is not a popular figure, both for personal and professional reasons. Uh, he's certainly played fast and loose with facts in the past. Um, he doesn't follow some of the same sourcing guidelines that a typical newspaper reporter would. Wolf's book is at times thinly sourced, at times simply a stenographic repetition of what certain sources have told Wolf. The irresponsibility of the publishing houses is worse than the irresponsibility of the author. Tocqueville said 150 years ago, democracies treat their authors the way kings treat their jesters. They enrich and despise them at the same time. These publishers don't care, so far as they are laughing all the way to the bank. Michael Wolff did not make his name covering politics. His best-known work to date was a biography of Rupert Murdoch, a news baron. Wolf understands the media, the role they have played in the Trump story, and he would have known that they would find his version of the story irresistible. Fire and Fury, in many ways, is a reality TV book about a reality TV president. That's kind of the nature of Michael Wolff's style. You see things in the book that are reminiscent of reality TV cast of characters uh, who are constantly at war with each other, who are plotting with each other. Wolf knows how to sell a scandal to the public versus, for example, a serious uh, investigation of crime and abuse of power. The heart, the foundation, the essence of the media's fascination with Donald Trump is all about ratings. Mr. President, why have you been retweeting anti- Trump is effectively a steroid shot for the news media's broken business model. The deep dysfunction now gripping this White House. In the short run, he can help them survive. We won the election, we're gonna win the next one. And where do you go from that? I don't know. You're not the POTUS, you're the bloatus. Once you've had Trump, you can never go back. Just like a drug, unless you go through a massive, catastrophic overdose. See, he is body slamming CNN. Which maybe is what we're headed towards, because uh, I don't think any of this is healthy, and this will not end well. It cannot end well.
We're discussing some other media stories that are on our radar today with one of our producers, Johanna Hoos. Joe, over the past couple of weeks, Iran has seen some of the biggest political demonstrations it's seen in almost a decade. Social media is among the platforms where this battle is being waged. What are we seeing there? Well, government critics have been on the street since late last year, and they are demanding political, social and economic reforms. Now, the government has responded with force. At least 21 people have been killed and over a thousand have been jailed. Now, both sides are also using social media to spread their messages, despite the fact that Facebook, Twitter and YouTube have been banned in Iran since 2009. Now, this was the last time that we saw protests on this scale. Now, Instagram and Telegram, which is the country's biggest social media platform, are also being temporarily blocked. But people in Iran are used to finding ways around these kind of censors, and they are actually still using these networks. Funnily enough, so is the government. So the protesters are using social media to share information, imagery, and to get organized. What about supporters of the government? What are they doing on social media? Well, a dozen of Twitter bots have been created. Now, these are accounts that have very suspicious profile names. They don't have any profile pictures. They have very few followers. And what these accounts are doing is they are tagging certain images as fake, and they are discouraging Iranians from joining these protests. Now, they are also putting up tweets saying things like, oh, well, I just arrived here at the protest, but nothing seems to be going on, and why are you lying? Nobody is actually here. Now, on top of that, they've been identifying protesters in videos and pictures asking authorities to arrest them. But the protesters are actually fighting back. They have created accounts in which they share details of the security personnel who is confronting them in the demonstrations. Turning now to another story that you've been looking into in India. The government there has filed a criminal complaint against a journalist over a data breach, something to do with a very ambitious identity card scheme the government's working on that involves biometrics. What are the details? Well, this seems to be a very clear case of shooting the messenger. Now, this campaign by the Indian government is called Adhar, and it basically stores very elaborate details of virtually all Indians online. Now, last week, a reporter for the Tribune newspaper, Wachna Khaira, published an investigation in which she actually showed that she could buy these personal records online for less than 10 US dollars. Now, these records include contact details, but they could also potentially include fingerprints and retina scans. Now, the Unique Identification Authority of India, UIDAI, which is supposed to safeguard that data, said that the reporter violated India's privacy laws by trying to get access to the database and is now actually demanding police action against her. So the government's been getting some blowback on this, and not all of it is coming from within India. No, it's not. A lot of people are saying that this case is an attack against press freedom. And a whistleblower Edward Snowden actually weighed in on this case from Moscow on Twitter last week, saying that the journalists that are exposing the Adhar breach deserve an award, not an investigation. Do you want to arrest those responsible? They are called the UIDAI. Thanks, Joe. Egyptians call them emperors, and every night millions tune in to watch them, lecture, entertain, rant, and even cry their way through hours of television output. They are talk show hosts, and as a group, they form a key filter through which Egyptians have come to view their politics. Under the rule of Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, talk shows are used to legitimize his presidency and to vilify his critics. Television audiences may be dwindling in many countries, but given the high rate of illiteracy in Egypt, TV remains the medium of the masses. And few institutions are more influential than the evening talk shows. Not everyone in Egypt is buying what the talking heads are selling, though given that they frequently venture into the realm of the absurd. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on the highly politicized world of TV talk shows in Egypt. To say that talk shows are the most important phenomenon in the way that government communicates with the public will be an understatement. It's consistent, it's entertaining. You get the feeling as though you're sitting at a cafe with them. <laughs> and don't mistake it for a moment. This is not about bringing information to the people. This is about bringing the government discourse into your homes. Case in point, an Egyptian intelligence officer on the phone to a number of TV personalities, 
directing them on how to report the US decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. I was talking to you so I would like to ask you if you want to go to the TV. Please, please. Instead of condemning the decision, they should persuade their viewers to simply accept it. What is the Quds from Ramallah? The tapes obtained by the New York Times show just how involved the state can be in what goes out on the country's airwaves. Egyptian talk shows are an accidental byproduct of state censorship. When former President Hosni Mubarak allowed more private channels on the air, he made it clear that news bulletins would remain in the hands of state-owned broadcasters. Private stations got around that by creating discussion programs focusing on the news. The hosts of these shows were everything their monochrome counterparts on state TV were not. طبعا يمكن المشاهد اللي احنا بنشوفها دي مشاهد صعبه شويه يعني لكن الحقيقه انه يتحمل الحياه ويقدر ازاي يعيش بـ بـ بالامكانيات اللي موجوده They were engaging, emotional and opinionated and uniquely Egyptian in that they start out with a monologue that goes on and on and on. The monologue can be up to a half hour, in some cases 45 minutes, where you have a host not only talking but working himself or herself up emotionally. Sometimes you would have um, some very theatrical props, um, a bullet, a picture, a video. And the other thing is the interaction not only with the in-studio guests, um, but also with viewers at home. For example, we've seen relatives of some of the victims of the terrorist bombings where an audience member calls, begins crying on the air. And a host begins crying as well. And as a result, the host becomes this emotional link, this connection that brings people in their homes together. I can say at least 80% of journalists I interviewed in Egypt told me that they see themselves to be first citizens and only second professional journalists. And there is a strong call for subjectivity within the journalistic community that perceives uh, the issue of the ideal of objective journalism as treason. The importance uh, of the personalities at play are beyond crucial. Without them, these shows would crumble. Two of them happen to be the power couple of Middle Eastern talk shows. Amr Adib is the first. He is very likely the most handsomely paid. He has a natural instinctive intelligence, and the intelligence agencies recognize that. His wife is Lamisa Hadid. She is a study in upper middle class decorum and delivers her message not as opinion, but as fact. The third person that comes to mind is the most grotesque figure of explicit propaganda, Ahmad Musa. Ahmad Musa is loud, fascist, non-apologetic. He excels at a hyperbolically nationalistic form of diatribe that appeals to the lowest common denominator. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi took power four years ago with a vow to return stability to Egypt, staking his legitimacy on combating terror. TV personalities play a leading role in echoing the government's line. They create a shared sense of panic, purpose, and victimhood. One of the key aspects of these talk shows is the way they whip up a sense of national emergency. They react in a very emotional, sensationalistic way to very atrocious events. ضربك ضرب وحدتك تدميرك تركيعك 
you not only support the government, you bend over backwards, so to speak. So dissidents, political prisoners are typically vilified. They are portrayed as enemies of the nation. <laughs> And if you portray anybody as an enemy of the nation in a time of emergency, what you're saying, it's okay to jail them, it's okay to beat them up, and in some cases, it's okay to kill them. Talk shows are a very prominent uh, political uh, tool or political platform for messaging. You need to support the regime because the regime is facing unprecedented dangers coming from the outside, but also and mainly from the inside. There is a conspiracy uh, coming from the Muslim Brotherhood. Despite they are under fierce crackdown by the regime, every critical voice uh, can be linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. The roster of the bad guys, real, imagined, and otherwise, is constantly evolving to suit the needs of the state. Qatar is now public enemy number one. Turkey is public enemy number two. Iran is public enemy number three. قطر دولة مارقة قطر دولة إرهابية كل ما نطلبه من تركيا لا تبعد عنا هي إيران عايزة إيه؟ And depending on the day of the week Israel isn't so bad or is public enemy number 1A إسرائيل اللي هي العدو العدو الطبيعي And of course the ruler is featured prominently one way or another Very rarely do you hear criticism and when you do it is measured i.e. The critique isn't leveled at the president. There has always been a consistent awareness where the red lines are precisely. And right now, there are more red lines than there have ever been. And for the most part, presenters know not to cross those red lines. They know that their jobs depend on it. Direct criticism of the president, the military, or the intelligence services are all off limits. Cross one of those red lines and you could end up disappearing from the airwaves. Like Liliane Dawood, a prominent British Lebanese presenter who had her contract ended before being kicked out of Egypt in 2016. Or Ibrahim Isa, a journalist who, despite shifting his political positions to suit the times, had his show cancelled last year. And they're not the only ones. Ibrahim Isa is uh, sort of the, the, the type of muckraking investigative journalist who's not afraid of speaking truth to power. Before the revolution, for example, he became known for basically confronting Mubarak and his sons. So that's one example. Another uh, famous talk show host is Amr al He's not afraid to push um, controversial issues, and that was his undoing for airing a very famous interview. That got Mr. al uh, uh, fired. You have to keep in mind that it all comes down to information, who has it and who doesn't, how it's delivered. Hats off to the CC regime for understanding the 21st century, for understanding the link between lack of education, ease of dissemination, obstruction of information. The government has created an environment where disbursement information, unless it is tightly controlled by government, is all but impossible. Finally, it's award season. Hollywood's Golden Globes have just been handed out, and President Trump wants in. He recently told his Twitter followers that his own awards for bad reporting from the fake news media will be coming out soon. That inspired the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists to announce their own CPJ Global Press Oppressors Awards. Threats against journalists are no laughing matter. The CPJ says 2017 saw a record number of them jailed, and journalists are being censored, attacked, sometimes killed over their work. We'll leave you now with some politicians who have made it into the CPJ's Hall of Shame. And we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.